I, uh, as I was waiting upon the Lord and praying, I, I just was, I felt so impressed to share uh, something with you that, that the Lord has pressed on my heart. I want to urge or encourage you. A stronger word would be urged to press into God's presence. Take time to be with the Lord. Take time to minister to him and draw near and allow the Lord to speak to you directly. There's no substitute from hearing from God himself. Ask him to enable you to see uh, what he has destined you to be, what he has called you to do. Because there's no greater joy than to stand in the place where the Lord has called us to stand and to do what he has called us to do. There is so much fulfillment and so much joy in knowing that you're walking in God's perfect will for your life. Knowing that you are doing what you were born to do, what God has anointed you to do, knowing that you are planted in the place that God has planted you. And there is so much joy because you live your life with, with purpose. You know his plan for your life. You're not guessing, you're not doubting, you're not experimenting, but you know deep down in your heart and there is a peace that confirms that in your spirit. Don't rest until you have that revelation. And um, that's just by the way that I was impressed to share that with you. I want to start by reading um, a verse of scripture, two verses actually from the book of Psalms, chapter 19, verse 12 and 13. Psalms 19, verse 12 and 13, and I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Classic. The psalmist says, who can discern his lapses and errors? Clear me from hidden and unconscious faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be blameless, and I shall be innocent and clear of great transaction, uh, transgression. What I want to talk to you today is about the dangers of presumption. The dangers of presumption. And let me begin our study by saying that five out of the seven churches in the book of Revelation were commanded by the Lord through his servant John to repent, five out of seven churches. The church in Ephesus lost the first love. The church in Pergamos compromised. The church in Theatira was corrupted by the spirit of Jezebel. The church in Sardis died. And the church in Laodicea became lukewarm. Five of them were commanded to repent. I wonder what the Lord would say to the church in the city that you and I live in today. You ever thought of that? What would Jesus say if he were to write an epistle to the church? And you know, in the eyes of the Lord, there's only one church in every city. What would he say to the church that we are part of? in the city, in the city that you live in. And here's where I want to go with my message today. To assume that one's walk and relationship with the Lord is in good standing, or that we no longer need to repent of anything, is the highest form of deception. I want to repeat that. To assume that one's walk and relationship with the Lord is in good standing 
or that we no longer need to repent about anything is the highest form of deception. On the morning of the 27th day of April, the word of the Lord came to me saying, I want you to write these words down on paper and proclaim them to my people. Here's what I wrote down. One of the deadliest and most dangerous deceptions in the church today is when we go down a path of compromise, giving into our flesh, thinking that because we are under grace, we will escape God's judgment on our ungodly behavior. When we lose the sense of awe and reverence towards the Word of God, treating it as something common, we go down a path of deception. When we view God's commands as suggestions and not as commandments from the Lord, choosing which to obey, which to disregard, we open up ourselves to all kinds of compromise. Now, I'm going to take the rest of our time together and expound on the above statements. And by the help of the Holy Spirit, I trust that I will be able to communicate what I believe the Lord is speaking to His church, not just to us, the small group of people, but I believe this is a word for the universal church of the Lord Jesus. A number of years ago, as I waited on the Lord on a cold winter's day, I will never forget that morning, I heard the Spirit of God say clearly to me the following. He said, just because I remain silent over an issue, it does not mean that I approve or agree with it. There are many things which I do not approve of, yet I choose to remain silent about them. Now, quietly, I asked the Lord why he chooses to remain silent about such things. Why does he not speak and address these issues within his house, which displease and dishonor his name? His answer was very simple. He said, because there is no love for the truth. No readiness or openness to receive the truth about these matters. Many, he said, would rather go down living a lie than face the truth and be changed by it. Now, these words shook me to the core. And then I stopped and I pondered and I meditated on what he said, wondering how many things or issues the Lord remained silent in my own life. I wondered how open and ready my heart would be able to receive truth and be changed by it. I remembered the rich young ruler. You know the story. He sought Jesus for truth. He came seeking. He was genuine. Yet when, when the Lord confronted him with the truth, he didn't have the courage to embrace the truth or to receive the truth and be changed by it. And he walked away sorrowful. And even though the Bible says Jesus loved him, he let him go. There, there comes a time when, when we, we got to let some people go because they're not ready to receive truth. Now, just because God remains silent over our compromises for a period of time, it does not mean that he condones such compromises. I believe the reason he bears up with us being patient, being long-suffering, is because he's not willing for us to be condemned with the rest of the world, but to come to our senses, judge ourselves, 
and escape God's judgment. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writing to the church in Corinth, he says, judge yourselves so that you can escape God's judgment. And that's why God bears along with us. He will allow us to go a certain way and be patient and be long-suffering and be patient and be long-suffering and, and not, not allow us to come into condemnation or judgment. Why? Because he, he hopes that one day we would wake up, recognize where we are, and repent, judge ourselves. Now, you know the story of Samson. Samson ignored God's commands and warnings long enough by giving into his flesh, living any way he wanted to, even though he knew the will of God, the commandments of God that he has given him. He was born for such a time as that. And he continued to ignore God's warnings and God's commandments until one day he woke up from his sleep and he realized that the Lord had departed from him, leaving him naked and blind in the hands of his enemies to do whatever they wanted to do with him. When we continue to live in a state of compromise, we lose our vision. Our spiritual sight, our hearts grow dull, insensitive, no longer moved by the word of God. And, uh, and that's what happened to Samson. Here's a question. Can we really discern whether the Lord is present in our lives, tangibly present, or in our gatherings when we gather on a Sunday morning or whenever we gather together? Can we discern if he's absent? Can we tell the difference? I recall on the night I was born again many years ago, when I walked into that building where believers were gathered, I sensed a presence and an atmosphere that was charged with the love of God and the joy of the Spirit. I'll never forget it. I was dead in my sin, but I sensed a presence I had not encountered before. And when the preacher stood up and began to read scripture, the presence of God was so strong in that place that the Spirit's conviction came upon me and it broke my heart. My eyes were opened and I suddenly saw myself in God's holy mirror for the first time and I was horrified and broken because what I saw is that my sin, I saw what my sin did to the Lord, did to me and to all who loved me. That preacher didn't do that. He just read the scripture and he started preaching, but God's holy presence was in that place and it wasn't the preacher who, who brought conviction. It was the presence of God that did that. And when I repented based on what I saw, I received the mercy of the Lord and I was born again. God's presence did it all. From the time I walked into that auditorium until the time I left and when I got out of the building, I knew that I knew that I knew that something happened to me. I was not the same person. How much we need this today in our churches. There's hardly any conviction today of wrongdoing. No conviction. Most sermons we hear nowadays is to make us feel good about ourselves. When Job saw the glory of the Lord, he said in Job 42, verse 6, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. He saw, whereas before he said, I heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now I see you with my eyes. When he saw the glory of God, he repented. He repented for what he said. 
when Isaiah saw the Lord, he said, what, you remember what he said? And I, Isaiah was preaching for quite a while. I don't know for how long. This, this happened in Isaiah chapter 6. But in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, we see and we read Isaiah was already exercising his ministry. And in chapter 6, he said, when I saw the Lord, this is what he said, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He saw the glory of God. And when he saw God, he also saw himself and he repented. Now, I'm saying this again, to assume one's relationship is right with the Lord or that he's pleased with our work simply because he remains silent over it, it could lead us to eternal separation from him. Folks, we need to get serious with God. That's where I'm getting at. The scriptures are full of examples and warnings of people who assume such things and when finally we're faced with the truth, it was too late. Matthew 7, 22 and 23. All of us know these scriptures. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 25, verse 11 and 12. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Now, these examples are stern warnings from the lips of the master wanting to prevent us from going down the same path of presumption which leads us to destruction. Don't assume. No. Have the assurance of the Spirit and the witness of the Spirit. And I believe in order to escape such presumptuous ways, we must develop a heart which searches the heart of God for truth. We must become lovers of truth. Lord, give me truth. Help me to seek truth at all costs. We must become seekers and lovers at all costs of the truth of the Word of God. Many would rather be around people who inflate them with flattery, stroke the ego, telling them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear, and avoid people who are truthful and honest with him. Listen, such shallow relationships are a recipe for disaster, and they cannot protect us from deception, nor do they promote the interests of the kingdom of God. We must seek relationships of maturity, in our circles, in, in the circles where we are, where we move, in our churches, in our fellowships, that, that people who will love us enough to confront us with the truth in love when necessary and not allow us to walk in presumption. The Bible says we are keepers of our brothers. We look out for one another. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through to 14, we see the Apostle Paul openly rebuking and confronting Peter for his compromise. You ever read that? You saw that in the book of Acts. He confronted Peter. He rebuked him because he was compromising. Here is another major deception in the church. The thought that because we are in Christ Jesus, there is now, therefore, no condemnation. You ever heard that? 
Many quote Romans chapter 8, verse 1, saying, There is now therefore no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus, and stop there without finishing the entire scripture. But the scripture says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not, I repeat, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Do you see that? Let's quote the whole scripture. God's word is very clear on the subject. Romans chapter 8 verse 13. He says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. There's a doctrine out there that says, once saved, you always saved. I don't believe that. The Bible does not teach that. If you live according to the flesh, if you walk according to the flesh, you will die spiritually. Again and again, the Spirit warns us through Paul not to be deceived over and over again. He says, be not deceived, be not deceived. There it is again, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Very plain, very clear. Here's another warning from the Spirit given to the believers in Corinth. There again, Paul repeats, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. It's very clear. Are we still out there? I did say in my message today that I would bring a prophetic message, a message that points us back to the heart of God. No compromise. Repentance, genuine seeking the Lord in the fear of God, pursuing Him. And I'm sad that I see I've given an open invitation to all that, that attend on Sunday evening. None of them is on that I see. We call out to God so often to show up in our meetings. And we pray for revival, and it's good, but we do not prepare for revival. How do you prepare for revival? By turning away from our wicked and ungodly ways, from our selfishness. We keep claiming the promise in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. You know that verse very well. Asking God to heal our land, to forgive our sins, but we ignore the condition that says we must turn from our wicked ways. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and, we st and turn, turn from the wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive the sin and will heal the land. When we fulfill the condition and turn, he will always show up, forgive our sin, heal our land. Little do we realize on another note that if he does answer our prayer and show up in our meetings in our present state, <laughs> we would have an early homecoming. How many of us would really survive his coming if he would come in our midst in his, in his glory, in all of his glory? How many of us would survive? 
Ananias and Sapphira tried that. They were struck down dead. It's God's, I believe, long-suffering and mercy that prevents him from showing up in all his glory. Because if he did show up in our present unrepentant state, there is no telling what would happen. Often when I pray, I, I have been praying much in the last few months. My heart is burdened. And my heart breaks over the compromises that is prevalent in our churches today, while preachers and prophets remain silent for fear of offending people. Hardly do we hear today any warnings of impending judgment or admonitions from the pulpit. And we keep overemphasizing God's goodness and God's mercy and God's love at the expense of God's righteous judgments. The God of love is also the God of judgment. That's what the Bible says. We can go to the one extreme or to the other extreme. But God wants us to stay right in the middle of the road. The Bible talks about the goodness of God and the severity of God. Paul, inspired by the Spirit, writes to the Roman believer saying, in Romans chapter 2, Beginning with verse 2, he says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. I want to conclude with the following. The Spirit highlighted four main areas in which we must prayerfully examine ourselves. And I encourage you to do that. The first area the Spirit highlighted was our love walk. Our love walk. Are we walking in the love of God? Here are some scriptures to consider. Jesus said, But I say to you, Matthew 5, 44, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use and persecute you. How are we doing with that? Are we blessing people that don't like us, curse us even? Do we go out of our way to actually do good to them that hate us? Pray for those who persecute us. I grew the most many years ago during times of persecution as I began to pray for those who persecuted me. And I grew. I learned to forgive. I learned to love. I learned to ignore their insults and just return blessing and prayer. Here's another one, Mark 11, 25, 26, about forgiveness. How are we with forgiveness? Are we, do we easily forgive people or do we hold a grudge until the last minute where we know we have to forgive? And when you stand praying, Jesus say, forgive if you have ought against any that your father also in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, 
neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. I heard Kenneth Hagin say once that he said, if, my, if I ever found out that my faith is not working for me, my prayers are not answered, the first place I would go look into is this area of the love walk, the area of forgiveness. Jesus said in John 13, 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Peter says, love one another with a fervent love. If you love your brother, you will pray. Your sister, you will pray for them. Amen. You will watch out for them. Here's another one, Hebrews 12, verse 15. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Bitter. Unforgiving. That's a no-no. What about strife? Strife in the family. Strife in the workplace, strife in the church. The word says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there. Go your way. First be reconciled and come and offer your gift. Then the Lord will accept it. We must eliminate strife at all costs. Because strife opens the door to the devil. Let's walk in love. J John says, First John says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Walk in the light. Walk in love. The second area the Spirit highlighted was our money management. How do we steward God's money says much about us. Luke 12, 34 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The way we spend God's money reveals what we treasure most in life. Amen. We often say, well, and, and preachers preach that. Our, our ministry believes that anyway. You often say 10% belongs to God, but I say all of them belongs to God. If you are his disciple, you are God's. You belong to him. You've been purchased with a price. Everything you are and everything you own belongs to God. 10%, I believe, and first fruits ties belong to to the ministries that feed you spiritually. But the rest that must also be directed by the Spirit where He wants it to go. Amen. First of all, we got to take good care of our families. If our parents need help, we got to help them financially. That's honor. What about the poor, the widow, the orphan? It's not the government's responsibility, it's the church's responsibility. Amen. Praise God. We must allow the Spirit to direct and guide us and give us wisdom how to disperse and to direct every cent because it's God's. We are just stewards of God's money. Amen. Here's another scripture to consider. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. God's promise is that if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all the things that we need in life will be given to us. 
But the condition is he's got to be first. Not second, not third, first. Lord, you are my first priority. Your kingdom, the interests of your kingdom. I seek first that. The rest will fall into place. And finally, or rather there's number three, restraining the flesh. Hey, this is a big one. Restraining the flesh or crucifying the flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. The Apostle Paul is speaking here and he says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The Amplified Classic says it this way, But like a boxer, I buffet my body, handle it roughly, discipline it by hardships and subdue it for fear that after proclaiming to others the gospel and the things pertaining to it, I myself should become unfit, not stand the test, be unapproved and rejected as a counterfeit. Wow. Can't let your flesh do what he wants to do. Your flesh will take you out of the will of God and will drive you down a path of destruction. For he who sows to the flesh and continually feeds the desires, the passions, the natural appetites of the flesh, says, will reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life. Here is Galatians 5, 24. And those who are Christ's, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. God is not going to crucify our flesh. We have to do it. We have to rise up through the Spirit and put to death the deeds of the body. Amen. Enough said on that. And finally, giving honor to those whom honor is due. Bible says, honor your father and your mother. Not because some of them don't deserve it. Some of them have been bad parents. It's easy to honor good parents. But the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. And it doesn't say whether they're worth it, whether they're good or not. You honor them because of who they are and because God says so. We honor our parents so that it may be well with us that we may live long on the earth. Many have died prematurely because they dishonored their parents. And the Bible says, giving honor to all people. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. There you are. Let us seek truth. Don't assume that everything is fine just because God is silent. Ask him to speak to you. Let the peace of God bring confirmation to your heart. If there is a habitual sin that you continue keep falling into it, draw the line on your flesh. Say, that's far enough. Get up one hour early and pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Strengthen your inner man. Rise up in the power of the Spirit and crucify that area that keeps tripping you up. Amen. Check your love walk. Check your heart. Have I forgiven everyone? Do I hold a grudge against anyone? Am I in, in strife in my workplace, in my, in, in my family, with my children, with m- my church members? Do I live in peace with them? Very important. How do I steward God's money? Am I faithful in that? Am I consistent or am I in and out, up and down? All of those things 
we need to come and present them to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139. Am I in the right place where I'm supposed to be? Let God speak to you direct. Don't leave that to someone else. Amen. Shall we pray? It's a heavy message to bring. But you know, it's been on my heart for days. And, and I pray that I was able to communicate what I believe the Spirit wanted me to communicate. And I believe that you received it the way that I communicated and that you will take it to the Lord and seek his face in all of these things. Because these are serious matters. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your rebuke. We thank you for your correction. We thank you for your warnings and your admonitions over and over again, warning us not to be deceived, warning us of the dangers of presumption, not to take you for granted, not to take our relationship for granted, but to press into your presence and seek your face and receive truth and become lovers of truth because truth will rescue us from being deceived. We ask this, Father, in the wonderful name of Jesus, and we thank you for it.